Hi, Bookmatic Lifelong Learners. Here we are with Nick Velasquez. Uh, Velasquez, correct? Yeah. Welcome Velasquez, to the yes. podcast. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Matt. How's yeah, it going? dude. <laughs> uh, Nick is the author of Learn, Improve, Master, uh, which is a really cool book because, well, as as my you know listeners know and my followers know, I love learning about learning and uh, learning about you know how in, how to improve and apply what you learn. And that's exactly what this book is about. So yeah, can you introduce yep. yourself maybe about what you do, uh, introduce a little bit about what your book is about and uh, then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so you mentioned that name is Nick and I think the best thing to do would be to explain the story about how the book came about. So mm -hmm. I'm, also a, a, I'm also in love with learning that's going to be my biggest passion in life. I'm picking up hobbies all the time. Too many interests to count. And the thing is, is a couple of years ago, uh, I got frustrated by all the things that I wanted to learn, but I figured that I didn't have enough time to learn them all. So my choices were either cut down on the things I wanted to learn or become a better learner. So I chose the latter and I decided to study everything I could about how we learn and how to learn. And I was trying to find a book that I eventually wrote. I didn't want to have to write that book. Uh, it was never intended to be a book. I just wanted to find that information. So years researching and compiling, I was building what I thought was going to be the manual for learning for the rest of my life. And it was going to be just something for me. But along the process, I figured if I'm doing all this work, I might as well just turn it into a book and then solve the problem for other people too. So I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, I didn't know the amount of work that was ahead of me in putting together a book. And if I had known, probably I wouldn't have done it because uh, it's a lot of work. But finally, that's how it came about. I, it's just a book that I really wanted to find. I desperately wanted to find. And self selfishly, selflessly, I would, would have liked that someone else had written this book. And not having to do all this work and all this research and learning how to write and putting it, everything together. Um, but this book wasn't out there, so I, I had to write it. Now there's more. I see that more things are coming out in the same subject. But at the time that I was doing it, there was really nothing. You only have the academics, which were very difficult to read and very theory oriented. And you have a couple of things from, uh, let's say, Tim Ferriss, or you had Josh Kaufman from the uh, the first 20 hours, I think is, is called. Um, but they didn't seem to hit the points that I wanted, which is what are the principles and the strategies to become a more effective learner mm -hmm. and something that could, I could apply to anything I wanted in my life. That's mm -hmm. how it came about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude, that's a really good introduction to yourself and your book. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that you did write it because like, I personally have read the sci uh, a few scientific books about learning. And yeah, they mm -hmm. are a lot more difficult to read. Um, and when I read through your book, I was like, oh, yeah, this is like a really good reminder of all these different principles. So I feel like this is a really good book for uh, people that don't really want to take the time to mm -hmm. read all these scientific books. And it's, it's all right there. Yep. Another great thing that I really enjoy about your book is the fact that you include like action elements, because, you know, when we learn something, if we're not actually putting it into implementation, into action, then mm -hmm. that knowledge might just sit there. We might just like forget it and everything. Yes. So that's really cool. Um, Absolutely. And one point yeah. in there is that, so my approach, what I wanted to do, the first few drafts of the book, they read, uh, read very scientific because that's mostly what I, what I read. So I read a lot of nonfiction and a lot of scientific stuff. I'm researching the book. I had to go through a lot of papers and essays and things on learning. So it read very dry and it was, it was difficult to follow. And I said, you know what, let's change gears. Instead of teaching how our mind works and how the brain learns, I'm just going to teach how to use it. So the analogy that I use in the book is like, imagine a race car driver. That person doesn't need to know all the mechanics of the car, how it works exactly every piece and the aerodynamics and all this stuff. Needs to know the basics, but the essence is learning how to master driving. And that's the approach that I take is like, I'm going to skip, I'm going to condense the studies. I'm going to condense the theory as much as I can and explain it in the simplest form. And our approach is going to be how to use our brain, not how it works. 
And that's kind of what uh, it put it more on the application side. And I also decided to divide it into principles and strategies. So the principles, like this is the essence of how the mind works. And once you understand those principles, you can come up with your own strategies. But then I also go into the strategies so people have something immediate to apply if they don't want to start thinking about it themselves. So it's kind of divided into those two parts. And it took many, many drafts to get to that point and say, you know what, this is applicable. This is what I would have liked when I started this project. This is the point. This is what mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're like, you're very honest about the, the fact that you have broken everything down into like basically simplistic forms for everyone yes. to understand. I, yes. That's great that you're honest about it. And also like, let me ask you about the bibliography. So did you like include yeah. every, every book that you researched in that bibliography or is there like more, <laughs> more there behind were, it? There were more, okay. there, there were more, yeah. There were more books, but some of them I didn't enjoy. Some of them I didn't take anything from. Um, all this stuff were documentaries, essays, like scientific papers, which mm. they were not technically books. So I did not include them in the bibliography because the idea was to give people, hey, if you want more books on this subject or what I used for this book, here it is. But uh, mm. I would not, I decided not to include the scientific papers on those things because most people wouldn't go there. So right. yes, there was way more behind it. Uh, many that I did not include because I either didn't like or didn't use, or right. because the format didn't apply for a bibliography, especially documentaries, um, a lot of documentaries that like, they're not there. I mean, I talk about some of them, like Usain Bolt, mm -hmm. um, there's this great documentary on him, but it's not included in the bibliography. So yes, there was way more material that I used. Okay, cool, yeah. I mean, I, I, actually that's one of my favorite parts of the book, not the favorite, but yeah, I mean, I love the fact that you've got all these books here. Like if you really want to go deeper, if you end up reading Nick's book, you can check out the, like the bibliography and go deeper. Uh, I've read some of the books on there. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, so your book is a well-researched book and like you don't include too much about yourself in there. So maybe can yep. you elaborate how you have implemented these strategies in your life? Uh, yes like maybe give some examples of, of situations that you've used these strategies and sure. uh, let me elaborate as well, like on one part. So you have the, what, what you should learn, how you should learn it and actually doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. uh, yeah, maybe you can explain a little bit more about that, your personal experience in applying these. Perfect. I'll give you one last thing on the bibliography because I love the bibliography parts of books. So since you're nerding out on that, then I'd like to talk about it just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I put so much emphasis on that bibliography and the way it's organized. And it's organized by theme and everything. And when I send it to the editor, they reorganize it by, um, like by alphabet. And like, no, it was organized in the perfect order of how it should have been <laughs> and the flow of the book. Like, why are you putting all this work in the bibliography? Like, it matters to me. It doesn't matter if no one else can see it and no one else realizes that there's work behind how this got organized and what was included, what wasn't included. But to me, it matters. So there's this concept in, in Japanese called Kodawari, and that's the name of the, uh, the imprint, which is this obsession with quality. And even if people cannot see it, so it's something for you, it's your own standards. So there's this story about Steve Jobs who wanted to have the interior of the Mac look beautiful. And people say, well, no one's going to see it. And like, it doesn't matter. It needs to be beautiful. And everyone hears the story like, wow, he was such a visionary. Like, no, everyone in Japan is like that. <laughs> and he picked that up from Japan because he loved the culture and he saw how people approach quality. So yeah. it was something that he picked from the culture and used. But because for us, it's so rare, then everyone's like, oh, that's such an amazing example. And in reality, you have a lot of that. We just have it in, the, in a different country. Anyways, that's on the bibliography. <laughs> well, um, I do want to say that I love, go your, ahead. Uh, I love your bibliography. Like it looks Thank nice. You. Did you end up like, did the editor, editor allow you to do it how you wanted to do it? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Well, it, yeah. So if you see it, it goes, me. I love it. It awesome. looks great. Awesome. It's the best that's bibliography the I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm really glad that you say that. Uh, <laughs> it, it goes down 
from like the subjects of it starts with the science of learning and then it moves into memory then it moves into peak performance and then it moves into the biographies so it's all kind of organized by like this would be the themes that someone picking up my book they would like to go through it's like they're picking up a book on learning so the first thing is all learning related then there was a chapter on memory so this is memory if you want to go deeper into a specific part of learning mm -hmm. then there is this big performance which has to do with practice and other things so it's kind of going down with the content of the book and taking the overarching theme of first of all this is a learning book so let's mm -hmm. put the learning first and in the end is the bibliographies the philosophy books and the other things that kind of added some points and some personal touch to the book but that are unrelated to learning yeah so yeah Awesome. Yep. Thank, I, All I'm so glad like, <laughs> like yours. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Yeah. So going on your second question of how have I used some of the principles in the book in my own life? Um, a couple of things come to mind. One, as I was trying to become a better writer, I realized many writers, they, they have this idea of, well, practice is sitting down and writing. In a way, it can be. I mean, it, it does count as practice, but you can make it more structured. So not just because you sit down and do the same thing over and over, it means you're practicing. Sometimes it's just repetition. And if you approach it in an instruct, unstructured way, you don't get the most benefit. So for me, it was, well, there needs to be something that is the equivalent of practice in writing. And those are writing prompts. So let's say you sit down at a coffee place and you're writing there. It's like, describe where you are. Describe the person that just came in. And these are exercises. These are drills. So you're getting better at describing the person. It's like you only focus on that. But if you're just writing a story, maybe you describe a person five, three, four times in the book. So how are you getting any better at describing someone if you're not really doing those drills? So I broke it down into, I need to get better at these things. And I started doing exercise or prompts based on those things mm -hmm. so that's one um the other one also is like writing is cons consists mostly of editing so for many people going into writing and they think you just sit in the cabin and the words come like flowing through you and and that's so awesome and you're in this quiet place no that happens for a percentage of the time or is very short and then the most part you spend it editing mm -hmm. and rewriting so it's like, okay, understanding what's really the essence of the craft and then putting most of your focus there. So how do you become a better editor? How do you know what to cut, what to add? Um, how to make your writing seem like more energetic to go faster, to be stronger. So mm -hmm. all these other things, and then you practice those things and you try to make it better, better, better. So much of the writing is just the rewriting. Those are where your reps are, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I used it in that. I also, I took on option trading last year. So options trading is a financial derby. And one of the things is, well, you don't go and trade live with big amounts. So either you open up a practice account and then you practice everything you're learning or you practice with very small amounts of money that are not really going to make or break you because you're trying to learn the skill first. So that's in the book, that step is called the bridge. So you go from practice, you're practicing something in isolation. Let's say you're in martial arts and you're practicing a kick against a, a bag, a heavy bag. And you're practicing, 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 you're trying to make it better. And now if you just went straight into a real fight, that's too much of a jump. I mean, the other person's fighting back, it's moving, it's all these things. So going from just kicking the punching bag and the heavy bag to a real fight is too much. You're not making the connection. You're not creating the bridge. So the following step from practice is called bridging. And it is how do we simulate a realistic scenario, but yet it's still controlled. So that's where sparring comes in. It's like you're with someone else and, and it's moving around or your coach is moving around and trying to pretending to hit you back. And now you move into position you throw the kick. So it's kind of how you integrate practice into real scenarios. So for me, I would learn a theory about some complex options like multi-leg options. They're like, all right. I can't just go and trade big money on this thing. I need a way to bridge the gap. It can't just be a theory. I need to also do the practice, but I can't go directly into trading as if already a professional. So you open up a practice account or you trade with very little amounts and that's how you become better. Once you see the flow and once you 
get that understanding and get better at doing it in that practice account, you say, okay, now I'm ready to start amping up the investment. So that's one that I used and it's, uh, it's very valuable for anyone. Sometimes we think, okay, I already practiced this enough. Uh, let's put an example that maybe would apply to more people than trading, but let's say public speaking. You say, well, I've practiced already my speech in the mirror all this time, I'm ready. No, you, you mm -hmm. need a way to bridge. Maybe have your family listen to your speech. Right. Or go to the Toastmasters, like go to an environment that is controlled where you don't risk too much, but that is, resembles reality a little bit better before you go for the real thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds That's me. That's a really of, good step that uh, when I was, people will take. Mm -hmm. Reminds me go of ahead. when I was back in a band in a high school, university, mm -hmm. uh, orchestra. And uh, yeah, we, we had our rehearsals all the time like every day during the school day. Yep. Uh, but whenever we had a performance, we would, if it were at the, the location that we could practice at or to play at, mm -hmm. we would have our dress rehearsal. We would dress up in our dress, our yep. uniforms and stuff like that and play on the stage as if we were, you know, exactly. playing for the whole, uh, for the whole audience. That's we didn't have an audience there, so it was minus that, but it was everything else uh -huh. was replicate, replicated, so. Yes, you bring it as close to the real thing as you can. Yeah. Without having the high stakes. And this do this in very high stake um, professions. They do this all the time. Like Navy SEALs, they train a lot in realistic conditions. Firefighters, first responders, all these people, they have to, they have to train that way because they don't have the luxury of making mistakes in real life. So they need to create these very realistic scenarios that are almost like what they're going to face in the real world and train there because they can't just be winging it in the real thing. You're like, okay, I learned this theory. Like now let's try it out when, when everything's going live and they can't just stay in, in an isolated practice of like, okay, here's, here's a theory and, and just keep doing this drill. No, you need to create the realistic scenario and run through it. Like it's the real thing. And that's how like big stake professions train, like same pilots, they have to go on, uh, flight simulators right that's just yeah. what they have to do they they can't they don't have the luxury to go on a plane and saying oh i, I started the theory like let's give this a go <laughs> <laughs> yeah wouldn't want that yeah. for sure no not at all. <laughs> yeah and uh you were talking about you know practice here that this reminds me of one of the myths in your mm -hmm. book uh which is a, a myth that i personally uh, I'm always thinking about, I'm always like, Hey, I really hate this myth because a lot of people mention it. It's the 10,000 hour. Oh yeah. Rule. I'm like, yes. okay, I know Malcolm Gladwell. He, uh, he, you know, misinterpreted it. And now, now everyone talks about the 10,000 hour rule, Yeah. which I mean, I think more and more people realize that now it's not just 10,000 hours that count, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, Ericsson study, right? Originally, what, yes. 19, what was it, 1970s? I don't know the exact date, but yeah, it was K. Anders Ericsson. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, maybe rather than me explaining it, maybe you can explain <laughs> All right. it. This is one of my favorite myths because I hate, yeah. I hate it when people say 10,000 hours because, yeah, <laughs> the original right. study was done on musicians. On musicians, yes. Yeah. There are many things that are specific there and we'll go through them. So yeah. first of all, for anyone that doesn't know, so it's like this idea that it takes 10,000 hours to master any skill. Um, so a couple of things there. And let, let's start with the, uh, what you mentioned about Malcolm Gladwell. So he, he took that research and then he put it in his book in a way that it was either he misinterpreted or people misinterpreted the way it was written to his credit. I watched his master class and he brings it up and he says, at one point I wrote about this thing and it wasn't exactly that way. And now it's just out of my hands. Um, <laughs> but, but he admitted it. And, and to yeah. his credit, he said like, that's not how it is, but, but now it's outside of my control. I can't do anything about it. And it became something that just spread like wildfire because it's a very marketable idea. It's, yeah. it's a marketable sunbite. It's easy to say. So a couple of things. The original research is by K. Anders Ericsson. He's an expert in expertise and expert performance. It was done um, on musicians at a very prestigious school, I believe in Germany. 
and not just my musicians, it was violinists. Okay. And what the study found is that people like the best violinists in that school have done about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice by the time they were 19 years old or 18 years old, something like that, before 20. So a couple of things there. One, it was done on a particular skill, not across skills. Two, it was not trying to prove an average of anything. It's just like they calculated that based on experience or like the, the recounting of their story, they said, okay, I think I practiced this much for this many years and all these things. And they calculated it might have been 10,000 hours. But again, it was just one skill. It could be many more hours for other skills. It could be much less for other skills. Um, it didn't set out to put a standard or an average on mastery. The other thing is that it was before they were 20 years old. They still had a long way to go. They were not yet masters at their craft. They were not the best in the world, but they were on a good path to getting there. So that was something else. They were just in, in, in a good spot in their lives. But then music has this particularity that it, it's a skill that's been around for so long that we have like this added knowledge and this added you're fighting or not fighting, but competing with people that have done so much practice in the past that the level is pretty high. Mm -hmm. So music is one of those skills that it takes a long, long time for you to become good at it. Other skills could be pretty simple and you could pick them up in a couple thousand hours, I guess. Uh, the other part is that he was looking at a specific type of practice, which is delivery practice. And delivery practice includes many conditions. One of them is that you need proper guidance. The other one is that you need to be in a field where there are already organized ways of teaching and methods of learning, and it's very structured. Um, the other part would be, so you have the teachers, you have that the system is organized. That is not mere repetition, but that you're pushing yourself to become better. So, and this became distorted by saying, if you put just 10,000 hours, you're gonna master something. No, if you're hitting a ball in golf and you're not trying to get better, you could spend 40,000 hours and you're not gonna be a master at that. Mm -hmm. If I sit down with my guitar and I play the same song, I already know how to play and play that every day, I'm not getting any better. Mm -hmm. So repetition is not the same as practice. And that was another condition. It's like, well, we saw that these people had done 10,000 hours of delivered practice, which is very different than regular practice. And the last thing, which is the most important one, what Erickson was trying to show is that even if you had a talent, you had to put a lot of work to develop your skill. That was his point of looking at the best musicians and saying, how much do you practice? And then finding out that these people had put thousands of hours in developing their skill, meaning that even if they had a natural aptitude, that was not enough to be really good at something. So the talent played a very small role in becoming amazing at whatever skill. And then he's, he ends with this quote in his book that says like, Delivery practice can open up a door to realms you didn't know even were possible. Open that door. His point is delivery practice can take you really far, regardless of if you think you have talent or not. Mm -hmm. That's what he proved in the study. Even the best musicians in that prestigious school had done thousands and thousands of hours of practice. Mm -hmm. It was not because they were born really good at, at music. Mm -hmm. It was delivery practice that took them so far. That's the main point is now how many hours is how far delivery practice can take you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this really makes me excited because it proves the point that anyone can pretty much do anything that they want to, as long as they're, you know, yes. putting in that deliberate, purposeful practice, uh, anyone yes. can get better. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, one of the first parts of learning is getting rid of those self-limiting beliefs that way you yes. can go out and, and at least try and yeah. do deliberate practice that week. Yeah, you can open up the doors uh, mm -hmm. to all the different possibilities out there. Uh, that's, yes. I'm very, very uh, excited about this, per, uh, this one particular aspect because of yes. that very reason. <laughs> and one extra point in there, and it's 100% agree. And one extra point in there is that Usually people complain about that or their argument when they hear they, well, you, you can get, you can be amazing at whatever skill you want. 
They say, for example, oh, what about a short person playing basketball? And now we need to make that distinction. And the distinction is being the best in the world versus being among the best in the world versus being your best. So mm -hmm. to be the very best in the world at something, you need a combination of many things. Yes, you need genes on your side. You need a great coaches. You need a lot of things going well, like the place where you were born, um, maybe your parents' encouragement, having had the money to put you through classes and getting you good coaching. All these other things needed to happen really well. And you need to have like the benefit of an aptitude for the thing. That's all required to be the very best. To be yeah. among the best, you need less of the luck. You need less of the genes. Uh, you need less of the other things that are beyond your control. So we need to remember, for example, that the entire Olympic swimming theme from the U.S. was not Michael Phelps. There were other swimmers there that were really good. They were not the best in the world, but they were really good. They were masters of their craft. They were master swimmers. They were not the top, but they were among the very best. So that's among the best. And then your best, you don't need any of the other stuff other than deliver practice hard work to become yep. your very best you don't need genes you don't need anything because it's you against you so mm -hmm. it's how far you can go and anyone can be their absolute best um and is that not noble enough is that not worthy enough because many people say well i could never be the best of this like so what if you like that skill so much you would still practice it so michael phelps he had no idea when he started swimming that he would become michael phelps nor his coaches, nor his parents. No one knew. There was no way of knowing how far this kid would go. He just loved swimming. And if you love swimming as much as Phelps did, you would just swim, regardless of how far it's going to take you. You just go and do it and see how far you can go. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's the entire point. And anyone can master anything. One of the points that I make in the book is, yes, so people bring up the basketball theme a lot because it's one of the fields where physical attributes play a disproportionate role of like what it is. Uh, so the game is designed in a way that gives an advantage to tall people. We can't deny that. Now, basketball is something we made up. So it's not something out of nature. We made it up and it has some problems where it gives advantage to certain people and not others, but that's just the way it's played. Now, a couple of things there. One, being tall doesn't make you automatically good at basketball. Two, not, not the tallest players are the best players. And three, Basketball skills have nothing to do with height. Anyone can master the skills of basketball, such as dribbling, shooting, rebounding, these things. The thing is that height gives a, an advantage for competing. I'm competing in the rules that we currently have. But if basketball had height divisions, like we have weight divisions for fighting, which obviously has to account for physical attributes. We know that now. That's why we have Walter Wade. We have heavyweights. Because we say we can't put this 300-pound person fighting this 100-pound person and expect it to be a fair fight. So if basketball had high divisions, there would be master players and amazing players, the best in the world, in any playing position. They would just belong to different height categories. Oh, so yeah. regardless of their height, you could have top basketball players of any position, but they just wouldn't be on the height class of some of the other ones. They would just be height divisions. But of course, it doesn't work that way. But my point is the skills of basketball are independent from height and anyone can master them. Master them. So you could become a, a master, master basketball player regardless of your height. You might not play in the NBA, that's true. But you can become a master at the skills of basketball. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That, I like that point for sure. It's, it's yeah, really good point. <laughs> Yeah, people so, make that an excuse a lot. It's like, well, I'm not tall enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not whatever enough. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point? I mean, if you like something so much, then just become the very best you can. And who cares about the rest? Why is yeah, that not noble sure. enough? For sure. Why is, yeah. that, why is that not worthy? I'm not, I, I'm not going to become the best writer in the world, or maybe now not among the best writers in the world. I'm starting late. Um, English is not my first language, for example, although some Russians, they became really good writers writing English, but I just like writing and I think I can become really good at it by practicing. And I don't care if I'm going to be the very best. I don't care if I'm going to be among the best or the most recognized. I care about being my best, my best. And that's what we all should care about. The rest is beyond our control.
can't do mm-hmm. anything about it. So just see how far you can go. And uh, maybe being your very best is going to put you among the best. Who knows? Maybe even the very best. You have no idea. No one can tell. Yeah. You don't know until you start. Right. And it yeah. reminds me of like all my running days and stuff like that. Uh, love running, love running. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not the best runner. I'm not among the best either. And, uh, but I love it because I'm always competing against myself. Yes. I'm always competing against myself and seeing how can I improve? You can apply yeah. this in any other area of your life. Writing, you yes. said, uh, as long as you're competing against yourself and not comparing yourself to others, I believe that you can always make progress and yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Actually, uh, what do you think about comparing? Is that, is that something that we should do, like compare ourselves to others or, or just use others as, as would, examples? That's a very good point. I think, yes, using others as examples. And I think there's a level of comparison that is very healthy and mm-hmm. it keeps you pushing your own limits because some of the people have done amazing stuff. I think the comparison of, that encourages you to be better is the one that's healthy. Mm-hmm. Whereas the comparison that makes you feel shit about yourself that's the one that really harms you and, and it pushes you away from things. When I was writing my book, many times I would stop and thinking, what would Robert Greene think about this paragraph if he read it? So I kept hmm. comparing my work to his, never thinking that it, I would come close to be as good as his. It was just a way for me to push even more. It's like, no, you know what? I can do better. So it was never like I could do it like Robert Greene because he was way too far away from my skill level, but I never felt bad about my own skill. It's like, how do I bring it closer to what he does. How can I make my skill better that, that it brings me just a couple percentages closer to the way he writes or to his quality, to his level of research. So I think that was a, to me, it was a healthy comparison that made my, made my work much better than it would have been if I had just been, you know what, I'm just going to worry about my thing and never see what others are doing. It's important to see what others are doing. It gives a point of reference. Sometimes it inspires you. You see mm-hmm. the amount of work that someone puts in is like, oh, wow, I've been slacking mm-hmm. and, and I can get, I can give more of me. So I think it's the comparison to see, you know what, keep pushing, you know, it's the comparison that motivates you to be mm-hmm. better. Not the comparison that says, you know what, I, I suck and I should never do this again. Mm-hmm. So it's more the attitude behind the comparison than the comparison itself. We need comparison. We need points of reference. Otherwise, how do we know that what we created is good or not? Right. How do we know if we're really doing a good job? So there has to be a point of reference and that's comparison, but it needs to be healthy. It needs to be, it needs to inspire you to be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. So just thinking uh, what, actually, I'm curious, what are your favorite like learning strategies? Like, cause I mean, your book is all about learning and stuff like that. And right. we touched on some, uh, yeah, maybe maybe you have a few others you can add to this conversation. Sure. So it's, it's not this or technically a learning strategy, but it's having having mentors, having coaches. So many people decide just to do things on their own. They're like, well, I'm going to pick up the guitar and just start making sounds and see if I can just learn it by ear or whatever. Like, No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's going to take you forever and there's you don't get a medal for having done it on your own is more it more speaks about you being very egotistical thinking that you you're either showing you don't have the capability of learning from someone better than you like the reluctance of learning from someone better than you or you just think that you can figure things on your own when other people have spent like let's say music there's been hundreds of years of accumulated learning so why why avoid that? I mean, if unless your circumstances prevent you from seeking out mentors or teachers or a really good coach, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. Really, they're going to help you compress time frames. A good teacher is one of the best things that you could ever find for whatever skill you're learning. And well, now that we have YouTube and, and things like that, of course, you can use those videos. There are really good books about it, and they can become in a way your teachers. But it's always good to have someone that is going to check on your work. So one of the things that I was doing, I haven't done it recently because I, I stopped. I haven't been writing as much as I wanted to. And a lot of things that went into my life and some things that got in the way and shifting focus. But 
uh, a year and a half ago when I started writing some fiction stuff because I wanted to become just a better writer, not because I want to write fiction, but it was a way for me to become more flexible and like, hey, let's learn a little bit how to tell stories and let's learn how to describe things better because still my writing is a little bit dry and it's because everything I've read before was scientific. So I was never exposed to that side of this is how you tell a story. This is something that becomes more engaging, more of a narrative. So I started writing short stories because short stories really condense and we go back to that practice loop where <laughs> if you would decide to write a novel, you're going to spend two years and then realize, well, I, I'm really bad at beginnings. I'm really bad at endings or I'm really bad at creating characters. And now you spend two years on that to realize that you did it all wrong. But a <laughs> short story could take you a week, two weeks, and you have to go from beginning to end and develop characters in between. So it's just really quick practice. You can get, you can do 20 of these in a year. Let's call it 12 if you're doing one, one of them. So you're just practicing like everything over and over. You're going from beginnings, middle, endings, developing characters, uh, showing environments, all these things. So imagine that you're really compressing practice. And then, so I, I wrote this short story and the first thing I did was send it to an editor. So you can find editors on the website called Red Sea. No mm -hmm. affiliation, they're just really good. And my point was, I want to see what I'm doing wrong. Otherwise, I can't get any better. And I need professionals to look at my work so they can tell me, here's where you lack. This is what you need to get better at. So it wasn't just about sit down and write short stories for a year. Like write the story and then have someone tell you what's wrong, how you can improve it. And the thing is, because I knew it was practice, I had no emotional tie to the story. I knew it was practice. So then you take that feedback more openly. Like whatever is wrong with it, I don't care. I'm just trying to be better. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the whole point. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I took a writing class at university because I wanted to get better. This was towards finishing my book. I thought if I take this class, maybe I'm going to be able to make the last draft even better. And in the class, so one of the things is the teacher said, you know what? Remember everyone, this... This is an introductory class, so we're going to stay away from the harsh critiques. We're only going to give positive encouragement. So don't mention anything that's wrong with the stories from your classmates. You're only going to mention the good things. And I'm sitting there saying, I want them to tell me everything that's wrong. <laughs> I want them to tell me how I suck so I can suck a little bit less. Tell me what's <laughs> right is not going to help me. I need you to be brutal with what I wrote because that's how I'm going to improve. So it was a very, and I quit that class because it's just not the approach. And you need to get your ego out of the way and someone to tell you, these are the things you're doing wrong, but let me show you how to make them better. That's how you learn. And for that, you need a really good coach. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point matter. about the, the feedback, which is in your book yes. as well. And uh, mentors, um, and yeah, books. Books can also be our mentors, but we get real good feedback from from real live exactly. people, right? Coaches, mentors. Um, yes. Yeah, that's yeah, a that's great really point because cool. the book can teach you, but it cannot give you feedback. Yeah. So if you when you're trying to refine and improve, for that step is crucial that you get someone else to look at your work. So yes, let's say we play the guitar. You can watch the YouTube video. You're like, oh yes, I'm learning this. No one's looking back at you and saying your positioning is wrong and that's going to hinder your speed later on. So I grabbed the guitar the wrong way because I never had a classical teacher to tell me what was the correct position. I was learning rock and metal and you don't give a damn about where you put your hand. And then when you're trying to go through a solo and you're standing up, now your hand can't reach the places you want it. And it's because you never learned the proper positioning. Mm -hmm. So later on, I was like, I wish someone had told me that I was grabbing the guitar the wrong way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. yeah. Books can't do that. Videos can't do that. So at any point, it doesn't mean you have to work with a teacher every day because I know it's expensive and everything. But every now and then you need someone to look at what you're doing and, and fix it, give you feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I have this, uh, I, ha I personally have this reflective process, um, so like self-reflect reflection, like whenever I journal or, you yes. know, something like that on a weekly basis. 
So do you have any self-reflection process that you personally do? Uh, a little bit different from feedback, right? Because feedback, we're getting it from someone else. Yes. Self-reflection, we're getting right. it from ourselves, writing it down. I find this, this process to be very helpful for me to just let go of all my internal thoughts and to reflect on the actions mm -hmm. that I've taken to kind of take a step back from my own self and look at myself from, from a, a yes. different point of view, kind of like metacognition, I guess, you know, we're learning about learning from a outside yes. point of view. Uh, so yeah. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. So no, yes, feedback also involves or self-reflection. So feedback can be taken from different uh, different places. So one that I mentioned was the coaches, and this is the easiest because they're going to be able to guide you. But there are other things that we can do ourselves. So one is, yes, um, doing this self-reflection after the fact. Let's say you went to play tennis and then you finish, and then you say, okay, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? What do I need to work on for next time? So you have all this set of questions for you to analyze your performance, your practice, and then kind of decide what needs to be worked on. So yes, the self-reflection is a very important tool for, for improvement. So it's, it's a mm -hmm. feedback tool for improvement. Other ways that we can do it is filming ourselves. So for mm -hmm. people in the performing arts, you need that. You need a mirror, for example, to see what you're doing as you're doing it. And you need also a way to film yourself, record yourself, so you could take a look at it from a different perspective, from like a third person point of view and realize what needs to be fixed. So I studied magic for a while. And when you're doing sleight of hand, practicing with a mirror is, is almost mandatory. You can't just practice alone at a distance because you don't know if you're flashing the move. Mm -hmm. So you need to be in front of the mirror to get that feedback. And then if you record yourself also from different angles, that's all going to help. It's going to help you refine. So all that is feedback and there are different ways to get it. So recording yourself in certain skills, practicing with a mirror, with writing uh, that you can't really record. I mean, you're, you're not seeing that as it happened. What many writers do is they finish up a piece and they put it aside for a couple of weeks. So you detach emotionally from it. And then when you go back to it, now you can see everything that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you see the places that you need to cut and everything because it feels fresh again. So that's another way of gaining perspective and having that feedback. You put your mm -hmm. work away. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci used to do this. He would cover a painting for a couple of days or he would go for a walk and then come back. And now he sees the painting again. Like, okay, now I can see what's wrong. Sometimes we're too close to it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. and the, and the writing example, I got that from Stephen King. It says, put your work away. And he puts his novels away for like three months and he comes back and he says the experience is is strange because it is your writing but at the same time it's not but having put it away for so long gives you perspective and now you can see all the places where it's weak mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i love having this podcast episode with you because you're mentioning all these points that i recognize from your book so it's like listening to you speak is almost like re-reading your book <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> good yes <laughs> yeah yeah it's awesome it's awesome so i'll i yes. personally will probably listen re-listen to this podcast episode like a year down the line just to get a refresher of of your book <laughs> yeah yes awesome yeah it's very very good and uh for the for the listeners out there uh yeah i mean i still recommend reading the book of course because there's so much more detail in it than our conversation this is just a little taste of it uh right here so uh, yes but it's very good to have on it on bestseller list right now or something um it's i think right now it's bestseller on amazon yeah. one of the things yeah, that i keep it on a very accessible price i think it's like three dollars two ninety nine for the ebook so i just mm -hmm. wanted to have the book uh, reach as many hands as possible so for me the book was never about money or or anything like that mm -hmm. so i just i just want that people can use the material and uh, yeah. in a way is is that higher mission of elevating the power the learning power of humanity it's like how do we all become better learners and that's just going to help everyone and part of it is i well i wrote it for people that are a little bit more serious about a hobby because 
So I know I know that a casual learner is not going to pick up a book and learn how to learn. So if you just kind of have a random interest on guitar, you're not going to pick up a book on how, learning how to learn before you start learning how to play guitar. So it's mostly for those people that are have a, a very big passion or hobby or want to go into a profession. And then it's like, okay, I need to start from the very beginning. How do I become a much better learner? And then I work these specific parts of my skill. So that's kind of how I, I looked at it. And in a way, my goal was for the people that take on a hobby, a hobby can be a lifelong companion. It gives you so much. I mean, I see all the people that don't really have anything to do, that they don't have a hobby. And, and I think that that's just the life, just it's lacking something. And when you see that people have hobbies, they go through their lives and they go to very old age and they're still very fulfilled. So it's kind of encouraging people to take on hobbies and, and take on these life companions that are going to be with them, that are going to give them so much joy. To me, my hobbies, I always kept at bay this dark cloud that insists on looming over me. So I'm always this dark character and my life has been brightened or they shone some light through all this darkness. The playing guitar, the writing, all these different things. I wouldn't know uh, what I would be without my hobbies, without the things that really interest me. So I I wanted to encourage people that maybe think that learning something new is too hard to give them the tools to empower them to say, yes, you can pick up a new hobby. You can even pick up a new profession. Maybe it's the person working in accounting that is dreaming about becoming an artist, uh, painting, but doesn't know where to start. Doesn't mm -hmm. know if it's going to be too hard for, for, for her or for him. So I wanted to encourage people to take on a new skill or to really go deep into the one they're writing in and give them the tools to become better because that's also going to make the journey more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these that skills... Is, that is frustrating for people is that they see... Yeah, they see that it's too complicated or they find that it's too hard. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay there. So, uh, yeah. Uh, a little these, bit, no worries. Yeah, these skills are definitely, definitely essential. And uh, I see your point about the, the fact that maybe... Not a casual reader will pick this up, but more of like a, a person that is uh, like seeking to improve their skills. And um, I, I do like the point that you bring up about habits. I'm sorry, not habits, hobbies. Um, hobbies yeah. About hobbies. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, hobbies are, are something that can bring us joy outside of the work that we do on a regular basis. Um Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it just makes us, our life even uh, even better and builds communities too, especially like if we're yes. you know, joining some sort of club or something like that uh -huh. about our hobby. So yes. uh, do you have any clubs that you are involved in based on your hobby? No, I don't. So when I was playing guitar, uh, I had my band. So obviously that was my group. When I started writing, I joined this class because uh, I thought it, like I'm going to meet all the writers and it's going to be fun, but the class turned out to be such a disappointment. And I don't think I have anything right now that it's, well, I also studied Japanese and I went to formal language school. So I had my friends from there. So that was really cool because we all learned Japanese and, and you, you create that bond. So I think, yeah, hobbies just introduce you to another other communities and they bring so much joy and so much um, fun to your life. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't recommend it enough. If someone not having a hobby at one point when their work stops, then what's left? I don't know. Right. I, right. I wouldn't imagine my life without hobbies. I just wouldn't. I have so many interests that I, the problem is like what to choose. What, <laughs> what do I stick with? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reminds me of my dad. He's already, what, 67, almost 68 now. And uh, mm -hmm. he's retired and uh, his hobby now is to fly his drone and uh, he just got his license, his drone license. Yeah. And so he can turn that into a hobby that, you know, pays a little bit of money if people hire him yes. to, you know, do like nice. real estate photography or videos yeah. or, you know, stuff like that. So it's really important at an older age, especially to keep yourself busy and active and keep your mind alive. Very much so. I think about my dad and he didn't really have hobbies. So after he stopped working, it's just, 
he wouldn't know what to do with his time. And I always felt sad. It never picked up anything. And so there was nothing else to work on. There was nothing to get better at. And that's just a really tough position to be in. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to pick up Start a hobby now. and go. Yeah, and, <laughs> and going back to what you were saying uh, from the book that is more towards the serious learner and stuff. One of the concepts that I had in mind is that I wanted to create the next best thing to having a world class coach on your side. Mm-hmm. Like, how do I create this guide that is going to accompany you through the learning, improving, and mastering process of any skill you want? Mm-hmm. That was the goal. Yeah, man. Perfect goal. And that's awesome that you've got a, you know, lower accessible price for like everyone around the world. Cause yeah, three, three bucks for a, a Kindle book is, yeah. uh, is not bad at all. Uh, so I, I do highly recommend it for everyone. Personally, it gets the bookmatic stamp of approval. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, is there yes. anything else that you would like to add to this conversation? I think we're good. The last thing, and just kind of the very last thing I'll talk about the book is, it's also a very short read. And it, it was made, it was a conscious decision because learning how to learn is not an easy subject. So I did my very best to make it very readable, to make it engaging. It can be read in an afternoon. I think it's only like 210 pages, something like that. And I remember this line from The Psychology of Money, which is an absolutely amazing book. And I wish I could write that well. And he put this in the introduction. I was so mad that I, I, could, I didn't think about it myself. And he says, this is a short book. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and I wish that <laughs> I had put that in my book. <laughs> that's the perfect line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but yes, my book is a short book and I'm going to steal that line. You're welcome. <laughs> awesome yeah. man uh cool, right. cool uh where can people reach you like and do you have any like yeah where can people reach you do you have a website yes. uh, social media like all that stuff yeah i have all of it so i think the easiest place would be my website and then on my website there are going to be links to the book links to my social media the website is unlimitedmastery.com oh so cool yeah blog, i right? think i subscribe to your newsletter man awesome yeah, awesome. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, unlimitedmastery.com and there you'll find all my social media and everything else, links to the book, links to articles, to podcasts, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will definitely include all the links down below. So for those of you listening, check out those links, uh, follow him on Instagram as well. And, uh, I think Twitter and like any of the other social media, um, platforms, he posts some good quality content uh so yeah definitely thank you so much for coming on the show thanks for having me matt that was awesome all right take care